Oh, okay. <laughs> Whew, I check my pulse here. I, that's like old school memories of that. Screwing around in the backyard five months ago, not having any idea what I was doing. Okay, so I'm pausing for a second. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all. I'll just pretend we haven't had problems. I'll just, uh, this is the one that's going to replay, uh, remain as a replay. So let me play it cool, bro. Hello and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Thank you for joining us uh, for this talk on glacial till. The local time is 9.55 because I had a couple of technology problems, but I'm glad you're here and we will begin this program at the top of the hour, five minutes from now. Thank you for joining us. And we had 400 people when I started a few seconds ago, no, five minutes ago. We had five, uh, 400 people or something. And then I realized I had selected the old camera and I really like this new camera. I wanna to continue to practice with this new camera. And so I'm kind of stalling and waiting for them to make sure we're up to 175. Many of you are very, very good people. We are, that's already been well-documented. So there's two older streams that may be live right now. I don't really know but especially that stream where we were, uh, 400 of us were in the old stream and I quit it because I, I don't know how to switch while I'm live streaming to the other camera. I, I, I doubt that's even possible, but if it is, I don't know how to do it. And then I tried to do it, I tried to set up a new stream, but it, I was in some sort of window I'd never seen before. And so I got out of that one because I couldn't select the cameras and then I, Finally figured it out. Okay, wow, God, uh, give me, hang on, ah, geez. Uh, you know what's coming next if you're a veteran of these live streams. I'm pissy the whole time. I'm flustered, I'm angry, I'm snapping at everything. So I'm gonna do my best with this hot water. I'll try to get myself out of that frame of mind. But my knees actually, they literally shake. Going, oh, what, 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 what do I do? What do I do? And this is a whole ramping up process mentally and physically. And I got a, a new document camera screen that you cannot see, but I'm playing with that for the first time. I got a, I got a bunch of stuff. Okay. So good. I see we're almost up to 400. Uh, I'm, I always have this fear that someone took time out of their day to tune in and they're, they're in this dead stream and they don't understand and everybody else has left them. And so hopefully you can get them over here. Okay, um, a couple of quick uh, hellos. Uh, are we five by five after all that? Um, Kurt, I wish there was alcohol on campus. There is not. It is good to learn new things, but not when uh, 400 people are looking at you. If, if you've ever been a presenter in front of a group and you're struggling with some kind of technology and the whole room is like looking at you, especially if they're 19 and kind of snickering, it's not a good feeling. <laughs> I don't care how many times it happens. It's not a good feeling. All right, so it is, it is uh, loud and clear, good. Uh, yeah, I, I'm loving this camera. Oh, of course we have some people who hate the new camera. Hello, Cleveland. Uh, that's Drew Carey. Uh, Brew Winkle from the Netherlands, Newport, Washington. Professor Nick, that's me. Age seven, Patrick, that's you. Good morning, Patrick. Uh, Bruce is in the UK. Beaverton, Oregon. Hello, John. Montreal. That's Vincent. Ashley's in uh, Great Camera, Washington. Just kidding. Uh, Don. Uh, Backcountry Gary. Just trying to loosen myself up now. 
Woo! Florida's in Carroll. Carroll's in Florida. Yikes. Uh, Whitworth Geology, class of 80. Now they're scrolling too fast for me to read. Uh, Dublin. I don't know how to pronounce your first name, but I'm glad you're with us. Ewan? Ewan. Maybe it's Ewan. Ewan. Ian. Ian. Jan's in Vancouver, Washington, et cetera. Okay, I got a couple. Oh, man, I got one minute. Okay. So, townies, I think I'm just going to have this one more for you. One more for you. Uh, if you are a U.S. citizen and you really want to order this, it's not required. I, I don't know if I even encourage it. But if you really want one of these yellow books and you don't live within 20 miles from Ellensburg, uh, I mentioned this yesterday, wildcatshop.net, then click on gifts, then click on no, nonfiction books, and you'll get to this. It costs $8.30, and then whatever the cost of shipping is to you, and Darren over there says he'll try to get it shipped out to you right away, and I don't know how long that will take. But if you want to get this yellow book, which is our yellow book course back, we'll use it again today, great. If you are overseas, outside of the U.S., um, or anybody else who just wants the yellow book, but you don't want to do the ordering thing, which that would be me personally, but whatever. Uh, NickZentner.com. Click on Geology 101. I know what I'll do it for you real quick. Good morning, 101 students. We'll be with you in just a second. So here is what NickZentner.com looks like. In the upper right, it says Geology 101. Click on it. This is for you, Geology 101 students, as well. There's a very simple Google Calendar there, and you can see that uh, we here we are Friday, January 15th, and we will not meet again until Tuesday, uh, January 19th. And I'll be seeing you face-to-face, -face, 101 students, so I'm seamlessly transitioning from talking to townies to talking to the 101 students. Thank you for joining us live, students. Hey, guess what? Next time I have a lecture, you're going to be right there. You're going to be right there in the second half, the back half of this room, this auditorium that fills, it seats 120 students. And there will be 20 of you in the back half of the room, perfectly spaced with your masks on. Good. So I look forward to that very much, of course. But uh, townies, just quickly, uh, this says yellow book right up here. You can get the PDF. Uh, click on that. You'll get the PDF for free of the yellow book. Okay. Give me a second, would you? 101 students, you just joined us. Had some technical difficulties. All my, all my doing, but I think we're functional now. I'm talking in a hushed tone because I'm trying to hush myself, calm myself down. I hate this feeling. But as soon as we start talking about glacial till, I'll feel great. And as soon as I give, start giving the lesson, again, I'm practicing talking to you when you're here. So I'm shouting again. I got the mic down. I don't know. Is it up again? Should be down there. Kind of forget what I did last time. But I don't want to uh, go crazy with the audio, but I know I'm going to be shouting. And again, I'm going to practice doing that today. Uh, last uh, preliminary comment. 101 student, I have a document camera right here. So I've got two lens, two camera lenses now. The camera lens where I'm communicating to everybody and I will continue live streaming even though you're in the building. So the townies will continue to sit in on our classes. But I'm not going to talk into this. I'm going to talk to you. But this is a document camera, which Kathy uh, set up for me. Thank you, Kathy, in case you see this. Kathy works on campus. She's excellent. And so she's got a huge, long internet cable, Ethernet cable going from the document camera way over here to the council in the front of the room, and there's a big screen of me projecting into the room right now so that you'll be able to see everything of what I'm doing. Even when I do the laptop, that's the plan, but I want to practice with that today. So there's things that I continue to uh, uh, work out the kinks on. I suppose the experimentation will continue even when you're here. 
But at least the plus is, you know who I am. You've been attending class for the last two weeks, and so we will hit the ground running and beautifully. I promise. Last preliminary comment. And I'll get out of my way so you can copy down the outline in case I've been in front of it the whole time. I normally quiz you before we go on to a whole new set of ideas. And these is, this is the beginning of a whole new set of ideas. But I didn't want to do an online quiz. I thought it would be easier and best for us to quiz you in, per in person. So I'm just letting you know that our first quiz should be happening right now. And then we're done with that first quiz and then we move on to the Ice Age. But because of this unusual situation this quarter, you're getting this one today. Part two of this is on Tuesday when I see you in the flesh. And then I'll quiz you on Thursday. I've already talked about the quiz. I suppose I will remind everybody, including the folks who just fell out of their beds uh, on Sunday night, and they'll show up for the first time not knowing anything of what's going on. So I'll kind of give them the, the business. But uh, I'll get everybody up to speed, and then I will be quizzing you on quiz number one on Thursday uh, of next week. Okay, so it's time for us to get into it. Are you ready? What's that? Are you ready? How close can I get? Okay. This is new material. This is very different. So the first, what? The first six lectures dealt with geologic time. They dealt with basic rock types. They dealt with uh, tectonic uplift and a little bit of river cutting and rivers sorting their sediment. And those, kind of, those ideas kind of work together as a nice little bundle. We're not going to forget about those ideas, but we need to immediately, starting today, shift our mind towards the Ice Age. And so one way to shift our mind towards the Ice Age is to go to page one of your yellow book. In the yellow book, uh, 101 students, these have all been purchased for you. They're free. An anonymous donor bought all 25 books, yellow books. So I've got a stack of them here, and I'll be handing them out to you as you walk in on Tuesday morning. Um, page one looks like this. We've already looked at it. This is the geologic time scale. We only really care about these major words over here and these major dates over here. These are called geologic periods, and we're really ignoring the periods until today. You know, a traditional way of teaching geology is to have you memorize all of these geologic period names in the order and come up with a mnemonic device, et cetera. I don't know, I've kind of phased that out. I don't think it's that important for our purposes as a 101 community, and I do say community. But, I need to slow down and realize that if we're going to talk about the Quaternary and even the Pleistocene, yes, the Pleistocene, you've heard that word before, but I'm going to talk about the Pleistocene, I guess we do need to slow down and look at this. So first message is, we were down here with the Precambrian and the Paleozoic when talking about the Craton, metamorphic, the platform, sedimentary layers, Paleozoic and Mesozoic, Right? We're leaving temporarily. You know what? Actually, we're leaving. Most of the rest of the class is going to be Washington-centric, and we really don't have a lot of Washington history going back this far. And you'll see why later on in the class. So we're really leaving the lower part of the page one kind of for good, I got to say, kind of for good. And now we're skipping way up here. So the first major message. The next four lectures will be in the most recent 2.6 million years of time. The Ice Age happened globally in the, last, in the most recent 2.6 million years of time. And many of our stories happened less than 20,000 years ago, which of course is a fraction of 2.6 million. So the first adjustment today is just to leave the bottom of page one and get up to the top. 
Now, let's be a little bit more careful. That Cenozoic, which I've introduced to you before as the most recent uh, geologic era, 66 million years ago until today, can be subdivided into the tertiary period and the quaternary period. Fine. But the quaternary period can be split into two smaller chunks yet, which I haven't written down. But I guess I will for you. Walking in circles now. This is fun. A smaller unit of geologic time yet, in other words, you can take eras and split them into smaller chunks of time called periods, but you can also take each period and split it into epochs, E-P-O-C-H. And the Pleistocene, which is the most common word to associate with the Ice Age, is one of the epochs of the Quaternary period. That's all I want to say. Okay? When I say Pleistocene for the next few days, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's a majority of the Quaternary period, and we don't even care much more than that. You can Google Pleistocene if you really care about it. But the point is, we're in the Pleistocene for all this ice drama. And there is major drama, especially when we talk about the Ice Age floods here in the Pacific Northwest. The Missoula floods, the Brett's floods, the Spokane floods. That's not today, that's not next time, but we're heading there. And that is sexy, sexy stuff that every resident of Washington should know a ton about, and they just don't. That's Washington, that's not globally. We have one of the most exciting Ice Age set of landforms anywhere in the world. I don't usually say it, that sounds like such an American thing to say. We got the best and the biggest in the whole wide world, the whole world over. I don't normally say that. And there are other places in the world that experience massive Ice Age floods, but we have an exceptionally exciting story best on display in Eastern Washington. So I'm particularly excited to share Ice Age floods with you and try not to get too bothered by the fact that you went K through 12 in this state and didn't learn it at all, <laughs> whatever, okay? So we're heading to the Ice Age floods, but not today. What I do want to do today, I know many of you are from the west side. Uh, distant viewers, we talk about western Washington as the west side. At least that's our slang over here on the east side. And it's very dry, generally, climatically, here on the eastern side of the Cascade. So eastern Washington is brown and like a desert. And western Washington, where most of our students are from, is over the mountains. Hour and a half, two hour drive, go over to the west side of the mountains, and so we're going to be looking primarily on west side glacial geology today uh, and, um, and won't be spending much time in eastern Washington today. Now, since most of you are from the west side and your hometown, many of your hometowns are exactly part of this story, I do want to have this geology world intersect with your world, with your backyard. Are you going home this weekend, three-day weekend? You can tell all your friends and family about the ice that used to be in your backyard. So let's do it. Okay, I'm walking in circles again. I don't know why. Oh, I do know why. Uh, my big experimentation, in addition to the, the new screen for projecting to the classroom, is a new way to show stuff on the laptop. And uh, we'll see if it works. So this is the laptop, and instead of holding it like this and struggling to advance, etc., I have another idea. Oh, I have the calendar letting me know about meetings that are super important. Not. Okay. So you ready for the big reveal? Uh... Now, is this full screen for you? It's not, but that's kind of by design. I kind of want to be in here, first of all, because I think I'm extremely handsome. And also, I want to interact with you a little bit. You know, 
I hope it's clear to you that I like to do things differently than everybody else. I get a big charge out of that. I like to put my personal stamp on it. And if you show slides in a Zoom talk or whatever, the speaker goes away or the speaker's in a little postage stamp and the thing becomes static immediately. So I'm trying, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's on purpose that I'm constantly screwing around with stuff and kind of getting in here because uh, especially with you not in the room, I don't feel like I'm communicating with you like I normally like to. So it's going to be intense. I'm going to warn you. It's going to be intense when you walk in. Like almost unhealthy. Like what is this guy's problem? He's in my face with his mask on. Asking about this. What's my social security number? What's it? Just kidding. It, I don't like to just go through the motions. Okay? So we're going to try this this way, at least today. And... I don't mean to too mu do too much talk about the technology here, but I've got two cameras, the document. So in other words, I want to project this to the whole room. I have to project this to the whole room. You're the customers. So I'm going to try to do this without reflection and so that you, uh, the uh, townies and you can all see this together. Okay, what's this? It's a big freaking rock, man. It's a big rock. It's called an erratic. It's on your outline. Oh, I like this. I can just roll it out of the way. So glacial erratics are huge boulders that do not match the local bedrock. I'll say it one more time. You got a big boulder? Fine. It's not necessarily an erratic, but it is an erratic if that boulder does not match the local bedrock, i.e. Oh, man, there's a big boulder of granite, but the bedrock here is limestone. Or there's a big boulder of limestone. And the bedrock here is granite, and so on and so on. A huge boulder that does not match the local bedrock. So I'm going to show you just a bunch of beautiful Tom Foster photos of Puget Sound, Puget Lowland, where not only do we have huge glacial, not only do we have huge boulders, we have interpreted them as glacial erratics. There's Teresa Foster, a normal-sized person at low tide in Puget Lowland. Each of these boulders has a story to tell, and collectively, if you take the time to map these boulders, as far east as North Bend, as far west as Port Angeles and beyond, they're huge boulders, but they do not match the local bedrock. And there's more detail here as well that we're not ready for to convince ourselves that these boulders were moved by a huge glacier, a huge ice sheet. Now, even in eastern Washington, this is a rock called Jaeger Rock. Did I write that? No. So we have some of these incredible erratics, glacial erratics, in eastern Washington, on the east side as well. But we have to be careful. There's a lot of big boulders over here that are part of that flood story and not the ice. Please be disciplined. Today, we're only looking at boulders that were clearly moved and dropped directly by an ice sheet. Now, come on now. How can you drive through this country? Now, we're in northern Washington on the east side. How can you drive through those wheat fields and not notice all these rocks? I guess it's possible. Furthermore, if you get curious about the rocks, what kind of stories do people tell each other over there? Oh, do you know all these rocks? The highway department brought these in, scattered these around. No. There's overwhelming evidence that the ice from Canada, a huge sheet of ice from Canada crossed the border, crossed south into Washington, and one way to map exactly where that ice sheet was is to find these boulders. There's a map of just a portion of a continental glacier. Oh, I like this. I can go out there, I can get real up close and personal, and I can wheel this puppy right back in. Are we functional? 900 people. Okay, we must be functional. Otherwise, everybody would have left. There are two kinds of glaciers on this planet, young people, even today. 
I'm going to give it to you verbally. Are you ready? There's continental glaciers and there's alpine glaciers. They're both bodies of ice. Both continental and alpine glaciers respond to changing global climate. We're just focusing on the continental glaciers today. You want another phrase that is synonymous or means the same as continental glacier? Ice sheet. Okay? So I'll casually refer to the Canadian ice sheet or the Canada ice sheet because all of Canada, that's the country north of us, all of Canada was under this ice sheet multiple times during the Pleistocene. But you'll notice there's a more formal name called the Cordilleran ice sheet. And there's another ice sheet called the Laurentide. I don't think we care about the difference right here. We had a big ice sheet over Canada and a part of that ice crept down into Washington. There's Interstate 90. So you're like, oh shit, man, I think I see. That's Seattle. Was Seattle really under ice? You bet your bippy it was. How much? Well, over 3,000 feet of ice. You heard me. I didn't freeze. I did, but I didn't freeze the broadcast. Over 3,000 vertical feet of ice. That's the thickness of the ice sheet over Seattle. More than three Columbia centers high. And I just found this map this morning, and I like it so much, I think I am going to come in a little closer. I don't know, how's the focus? Can it handle that? Can you read those numbers? Ah, shit, I don't have to worry about the document camera today. I've wanted a map like this in the Washington Geological Survey. Is your tip of the day. Google, please, at some point, Washington Geological Survey, WGS, the Washington Geological Survey. They have an excellent website. Many of our former graduates from this geology department now work for them, so it's kind of a plug. But I found this map. I didn't know they had that. I swore that I checked that site uh, within the last few months, but this may be a newly posted map, but I love it because it shows not only the extent of Western Washington that was under the ice sheet, but approximate thicknesses. Now, I can't tell if you can read those numbers or not, but as you get farther north of Seattle, the thickness of the ice sheet increases to over 4,000. What's those? Yeah. Up by Port Angeles, the ice sheet was more than 4,000 feet thick. And then you can also see that south of Seattle, south of Olympia, there's a little town called Tenino, and that's the southern margin of this ice sheet that covered western Washington. So I'm sure you're curious, how do they know that? How do the experts know that the ice was that thick? That's, I mean, it's 3,000 feet elevation at Snoqualmie Pass, for goodness sake. We're saying that the ice was thicker than the elevation of Snoqualmie Pass? Yes. And I've email, emailed, I don't know how many experts on this, and I can never get a really satisfying answer, i got to be honest. One way to convince yourself that the ice was a certain thickness is you're finding erratics that are up on tops of ridges in the Puget Lowland. So in other words, you can extrapolate between those glacial erratics and you know that there weren't alpine glaciers nearby, and so you can come up with a previously existing ice thickness of the ice sheet that way. But then it gets a little murky, at least for me. There was clearly a depression of the crust. The weight of this ice sheet was so severe that it caused the crust of western Washington to depress, to go down, to sink. And so obviously our elevations then become uh, different above sea level. So there's some physics involved, there's some geophysics, there's some mantle displacement, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is we had major amounts of ice sitting over top of Seattle. So, so far so good. Maybe that's kind of what you imagined we'd talk about today, although you probably were confused. I don't know what glacial till is and we haven't gotten there yet. But it's time for another verbal message to you. When you study the Pleistocene, the Pleistocene epoch, the time of the ice. It's a dynamic time, meaning that it wasn't just a bunch of ice sitting there and then it shrivels away. 
Instead, glaciers are more dynamic than you give them credit for. I'm sticking up for glaciers today. Alpine or continental glaciers, there's a lot going on inside of a glacier. There is flow. There's interior flow of a glacier. There's rocks being picked up and carried and dropped by a glacier. And we're not going to do all of that today, but that is the message eventually, that this is not stagnant ice. Instead, this is ice that's flowing. What else do I have for you? My blood pressure is finally down. Okay. So this, is, it, this animation takes its sweet time, but it's done by Ralph Hagerud at the United States Geological Survey. And this is really the last 20,000 years of time. It's playing right now. And the dark blue is salt water connected to the Pacific Ocean. And eventually we're going to get some light blue in here, which is some fresh water. So we had fresh water lakes for a time. Here comes the ice sheet advancing south. Remember I said the ice is actually flowing. It's dynamic. And so we cut off the marine water from the Puget Ocean. Uh, and we don't have any marine water, any salt water in the Seattle area during this maximum ice sheet time. There's the ice all the way down to Tenino, Washington, filling this broad basin and depressing the crust. But the animation continues to play, and now we retreat or melt back that ice sheet, and notice we do have huge freshwater lakes that are sitting in this basin. No connection to the ocean. It's still fresh water. It's light blue. It's still fresh water. It's light blue. It's only going to turn to marine. Bam, right there. We're only going to get dark blue, which is marine water, when we finally open the Strait of Juan de Fuca and we allow salt water from the ocean to come back in. There are only two remaining freshwater bodies of water in Puget Lowland, Lake Sammamish and Lake Washington. The rest were converted back over to salt water. Here is the same message, but a much quicker story. In case you have attention issues. Now that was just the most recent advance of the ice sheet into the Seattle area. We now have evidence of seven different advances. Advance, retreat, advance, retreat. These are military terms. But that's the way we view the Pleistocene history of the ice sheet just in Seattle. But eventually, actually in a few minutes, we're going to broaden our scope and realize it's not just a Seattle story. These are what glacial deposits look like. So many of you know Western Washington shorelines. You've been out on a boat in Puget Sound, or you've hiked along Discovery Point or West Point or Discovery Park, I guess it's called. Countless other places along Whidbey Island, uh, Fort Flagler, um, uh, Port Townsend. Uh, what's your favorite spot? Fox Island, Vashon Island, down at Tacoma, Olympia. Those bluffs are all made out of glacial till. Glacial till. I'm about to define it, but glacial till is just a bunch of this kind of loose junk making up these bluffs. And when you put in tunnels like these two tunnels that were put in in the 1940s when they were um, connecting downtown Washington with the east side over by Bellevue, it was pretty easy tunneling. It wasn't solid bedrock, in other words. So in case it hasn't dawned on you, almost all of the hills of the Seattle area are made out of glacial till, not solid bedrock. It's like earth as opposed to solid bedrock. And before I lose the slides here, I'm going to do some stuff on the chalkboard with you in a bit. You can tease out some very fascinating details. This is during the retreat of the ice sheet that I just showed you in the animation. Here's downtown Seattle. Uh, North Bend is over here. So here's, you know, the drive. All of us know the drive from Seattle to North Bend. That's about a 30 minute drive. The Issaquah Alps are to your south. But at different snapshots in time, we had all this fresh water ponded between the retreating ice sheet 
and these high spots called the Issaquah Alps. And depending on which snapshot in time we're talking about, there's sudden bursts of water from one ice age lake to the next. And so instead of just ice sheet kind of retreating kind of uh, without drama, there's all these amazing river deltas from the ice age time when you had ice age rivers flowing from one former glacial lake to the next former glacial lake. And you drive right by it all the time. Do you know Issaquah? Do you know the big gravel pit that's right off to, to your left as you're driving east? And over by North Bend. I assume you know where I'm talking, Central students. If you're from the South Sound, at least you'd know State Route 18. You go through Auburn, et cetera, and then before you know it, you're kind of at North Bend. This is the North Bend area. And here's Glacial Till down low. And here are some nice images showing that Puget Lobe uh, from Canada flowing into the foothills of the Cascades. And so we had more freshwater lakes between North Bend and, uh, and that climb up towards um, Fall City. I love this image here, also from Tom Foster. You're going to hear me mention Tom Foster a lot uh, in this class. He, he created many excellent visuals for teaching and custom made them for this class. So uh, I'll always be grateful to Tom for that. Here's a nice image showing Interstate 90 by, past North Bend, and then here's Glacial Till and Ice Age River Delta material. You know, the ice is gone. News flash, the ice is gone, but these deposits remain. And so they can help us reconnect or reconfigure where the ice used to be. Okay, you've got it. Okay, let's, let's do something with a chalkboard now. That's a bit more slide stuff all at once that I wanted to do with you that I typically do with you, but I think it was important to try to bring you in with places that register with you. Remember, that's one of the themes of this class. Instead of talking about geology in a vacuum, I want to talk about geology that intersects with your first 19 years on the planet. And many of these places have a glacial signature. Okay, so I'm going to switch chalkboards. I want to talk about what a glacial moraine is, what glacial till is, and uh, we'll use the yellow book a little bit more as well. We doing okay? Are we doing okay? Excuse me, I'm just gonna pause for just a second. Are we doing okay? We got a thousand people. Uh, the live chat has stopped, is that true? No, it's still going, five by five, Oscar. Okay, great, thank you. All right. And the new two things I'm practicing with today, forgive me, is working with this document camera, knowing where to stand so that I can see that I'm projecting this chalkboard to the classroom. And then also this laptop on the cart, which I'm not sure that was successful or not. I'll have to watch it later. Or maybe you'll have a comment on whether you thought that was successful or not. Okay. Now let's do it this way. Isn't that cute? That's a pile of rocks. And they're not cemented together. I could go into that pile of rocks that I find next to the freeway, and I could just start picking stones out of that pile. And let's say that pile of rocks has been sitting there like that for thousands of years. We can describe that pile of rocks using terminology we did a few lectures ago. That pile of loose rocks is well sorted. And well sorted is a descriptor saying all the rocks are pretty much the same size. They've been sorted by size. And if you recall, and you're a good student and you've been with us every step of the way, 
you immediately know what used to be in that area to create that pile of loose rocks that are well sorted. Again, well sorted means all the rocks are about the same size. Who deposited those well sorted rocks? A river. And you're like, well, how do you know that? And I'm like, watch the replay a couple days ago. We were talking about burial metamorphism, and to do that, we were talking about a cross-section of the state of the Colorado, remember? And we had a river taking sediment coming out of the Rocky Mountains, and the river was sorting the rocks by size. And so we had a pile of well-sorted river cobbles, and then further downstream, we had a pile of well-sorted sand grains, and so on. Remember? Rivers deposit well-sorted rocks. But today, the title of the meeting is Glacial Till. Glacial Till is also a pile of loose rocks. I mean, it's just the Pleistocene we're talking about. It's tens of thousands of years old. The piles of rocks from the Ice Age have been sitting there for less than a million years, oftentimes less than 40,000 years ago. So they're loose but they're not well sorted. No more screwing around, let's do it. What does glacial till look like? Poorly sorted. This is Geology 101. There's lots of exceptions. There's lots of Ice Age river deltas where you have well sorted stuff within the poorly sorted mix, etc. But let's just be as basic as we possibly can to get the main message across. If you have a pile of loose rocks and they are poorly sorted, and huge glacial erratics are sitting in there with a bunch of sand and clay and cobbles and other junk all thrown together. Glacial ice deposits loose rocks just like rivers do, but they don't create well-sorted piles of rocks. Glaciers deposit poorly sorted piles of rock. Glacial till, poorly sorted rocks in a big old pile. We got it? Now, a more interesting question is, why is this? Can you put into words why this is? Why do rivers deposit well-sorted rocks and glaciers deposit poorly sorted rocks? I'll just do it verbally. I don't want to get too hung up on it. Rivers are made out of water. Glaciers are made out of water but there's different states involved, correct? This is liquid water. This is solid water. So if we have a river flowing, it's liquid water, and as we discussed, the heavier stuff can fall out at a certain point, and then as we decrease the velocity of the liquid water, aka river, we deposit smaller and smaller sediment sizes as we lose energy. That was our message a couple days ago. Well, if we have a moving glacier, and yeah, glaciers move, glaciers flow. I guess this is another t-shirt. What was the first t-shirt? Uplift intensifies erosion. There's a slogan. Here's another t-shirt. Glaciers are really rivers in slow, mm, too wordy. Glaciers are like rivers in slow motion. I still don't like it. Glaciers behave just like rivers, but it's solid water instead of liquid water. And that's an important difference because why? What is this? This is a moving glacier. It can be our Canada ice crossing the border up by Bellingham or Blaine, Washington, if you want to be more precise. Luke Ridenour, shout out. And that ice is going to come down to Seattle and move past 
Seattle, so north to south. But there are rocks in the ice sheet of different sizes. And you're like, well, how did those rocks get into the ice sheet? Well, that's what's going on up in Canada. And that's ice flowing over and plucking up blocks of bedrock and incorporating it up into the uh, gravy train, essentially. Let's not focus on that. We in Washington, Western Washington, on the west side, we are the um, recipients of the gifts. These are Canadian gifts. These are Canadian rocks that are being picked up by the Canadian ice sheet. We cross the border, big and small, those boulders and smaller, and even grains of sand are coming down towards Seattle and points further south. But if we do have ice flow, and we do, we're going to be spitting out these rocks at the front or the terminus of the glacier. What's that pile of rocks going to look like? That's where we deposit glacial till. That is that. I'm giving you context for the glacial till. Glacial till is poorly sorted loose rock directly deposited by the ice. And then even if we erase even if the ice melts away, which it clearly has, there is no continental ice today in western Washington. You can go look if you want. It's not there. But we do have selected places an off-ramp here by the shopping mall there, beneath the whatever of glacial till that shows us where that ice used to be. Glacial till, river deposits interpreted differently based on how we study glaciers. You can go back to uniformitarianism again if you like. The present is the key to the past. What do the deposits today look like in Greenland? or Alaska, or Antarctica, places where we still have big and small glaciers? The answer is, when you have ice-deposited material, it's poorly sorted, just like this. It checks out. But there's also lots of running water coming off of a melting glacier, and that messes up our simple story. And I feel I have to include it just to be a little bit more complete. I don't want to belabor this because it's, it's not the main point. But quite often, when the ice goes away, we're left with a ridge of glacial till. Actually, let's slow down. That, this is one of the major points. Ignore this for right now, please. This is a moraine. You're like, well, hold it. I thought you said this was glacial till. I did. I'm, practice, I'm going to practice talking to the phantom people now. I did. I called that a glacial, I called this glacial till. But if this glacial till is shaped into a beautiful linear ridge, we call it a moraine. Let me say it one more time. If we look down on a map, No stick people in this now, right? This is, this is looking down from heaven, and this is a map, and this is not a river. This is a kind of a snaky ridge. We're looking down on a ridge. And we take out our shovel, and we dig into that ridge, and we go, oh, shit, man, this is nothing but like poorly sorted rubble. I guess this is glacial till. So glacial till is what's inside of a moraine, which is a ridge. And the moraines are important because they clearly delineate. They, they actually are a chalk line on the map 
telling us that the ice was here and there was no ice on the other side. It's like a chalk line around the dead body before they haul the dead body off to the morgue. <laughs> That's another major point. So now we know glacial... I'm not a term guy, but we have run through a couple. Glacial erratic, big boulder that does not match the local bedrock. Glacial till, poorly sorted loose rocks deposited directly by ice. Moraine, a glacial moraine is a ridge made of glacial till that was deposited at the edge of a glacier. The minor point is that usually next door, plastered onto a moraine, is a bunch of this uh, river cobble stuff, which we call outwash from a melting glacier. But I don't want to get hung up on that. So students, would you please turn to, how much, what am I doing here? Five minutes left. Uh, a little bit more out of the yellow book. God, simple. Why did I buy this? Why did we order that yellow book from that guy? It showed up three weeks late, and there's like these things. It wasn't worth $8. Page seven. So this is North America. Today, the ice sheet is still with us. This is a no-spin zone here. No time for politics. We still have a continental glacier during our short time on the planet, and it's on Greenland today. If we go back 18,000 years, can you write that down? I'm not going to write it down. Could you do it, though, please? I try to minimize dates when I can, so this is not a history class where you're just constantly writing down dates, but this is a big one, 18,000 years ago. 18,000 years ago. That's a nice round number. 18,000 years ago, this is where the edge of the ice sheet used to be. So what is 18,000 years ago? It's our LGM, all three capital letters, LGM, last glacial maximum. This is worldwide, by the way, but I'm focusing just on North America. A nice round number for us, 18,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum. So the ice sheet covering North America, covering all of Canada and more, including Seattle, including the farm that I grew up on in Wisconsin, under ice as recently as 18,000 years ago. And since 18,000 years ago, there has been a retreat in size of the continental ice. This is also happening at the same time in Eurasia. We finish today in the three minutes I have left to get us ready for Tuesday's session. It's inconvenient we have such a long layoff between now and then, but We'll try to just hit the ground running on Tuesday. We finish with page eight, which is what I was taught in 1984 when I was a geology student at the University of Wisconsin. So I grew up in Wisconsin. Do you know where that is? It's, in, it's over by Chicago, Illinois. And um, I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I grew up about 30 minutes outside of town. And I was taught by some of the leading geologists of the day. And the most current, up-to-date, exciting geology in 1984 was page 8. And can you please put a heading on this? This is really just to see if you can, uh, if you're up for following a direction from me. It's not a power trip. I'm just am encouraging a few things here and there. Page 8 is based on glacial till based on studying glacial till of North America. Yes, including glacial moraines. Based on studying glacial moraines and glacial till of North America, 
I was taught in 1984 that in the last 2.6 million years worth of time, there were four major ice advances across Canada and down into the northern U.S., and three full retreats of the ice. So the last two words for you today, a glacial is a cold time when the ice is advancing and getting bigger, and interglacial is the opposite. So when the ice is melting back and the glacier is getting smaller. This is like a huge pendulum. Ice advances, ice retreats, advance, retreat, advance, retreat, advance, and retreat, and it's retreating now. This is what I was taught in 1984. I was taught that there were four major glacials of the Laurentide ice sheet in the last 2.6 million years. When I see you on Tuesday, we're going to realize there's a different story now. And it's because we have new data since 1984 to help us realize that that number four is not as accurate as we know now. Geology 101 students, thank you for joining us today. Um, please email me a secret word, our safe word, you and I, the name of your hometown, please. Email me the name of your hometown, primarily to confirm. About half of you are doing this, by the way, which means half of our 20 students are in La La Land or are simply too cool to email uh, one word. So I'm going to be giving you the eagle eye with my little raccoon eyes on Tuesday and try to snap you into shape because I'm not impressed with you at the moment. But for the others who are not only viewing, but emailing regularly, I'm into you. And I'm looking forward to meeting you all on Tuesday morning. Have a good weekend. I will not see you on Monday due to Martin Luther King holiday. I will see you Tuesday in the flesh. The building should be unlocked. This is room 110. You'll find me. I'll be in here. You can come as early as 930 if you want, and we can get to know each other. Goodbye, young people. I love you. Have a good weekend. Townies, you want to stick around? We'll do some live Q&A. More than a 1,000. Fans of glaciers. Let me just check, see if I got everything here on I guess so. All right, uppercase, please. We'll do a few questions if you like, and then we'll call it a uh, we'll call it a day. Oscar, what is the typical thickness height of a moraine? Ah, that thanks. I didn't give a good feel for that. They're not that impressive. They're sneaky. Uh, hundreds of feet. They're subtle features. Um, I had more slides set up. What? It, Yeah. Uh, it's going backwards. I already showed this one. So that's a moraine. And this is what? This is uh, 1,500 feet elevation, maybe. So, you know, th they're not huge ridges. I may have told this story at some point, but. In 1984, when I took that glacial geology class, my professor was Francis Hole. And he was a character. He played the violin in class and all sorts. He was like a performance kind of a person. And he really influenced him. He wore a bow tie every day, now that I think about it. And, uh, and we went on, on field trips on a bus, and he'd be on the microphone. And just as we're rolling through southern Wisconsin on this bus, he's pointing, oh, there's a moraine, there's a little bit of outwash. And, he could see, this guy was just looking at these cornfields like I had done my first, whatever, 23 years of life. And he was seeing a Pleistocene scene. 
like what you know what's this guy on or what what glasses is he wearing to see all this stuff and so that's kind of the beauty of this ice age stuff that it's so fresh and new that these landforms um, are still right there in front of your face. Some of you were involved in the exotic terrain stuff before Christmas with our live streams. And part of the challenge is you, you just can't go somewhere and see it because you're going back hundreds of millions of years. Thank you. That's more of an answer than you wanted probably. Uh, compare Antarctica, please. Well, I, I really can't. I don't know much about Antarctica. I know that sounds weird for me to say. Um, I, you, you probably know about, more about Antarctica than I do. Uh, I don't know if there are moraines mapped in Antarctica. I don't know how much ice margin deposits there are, to be honest. I do know that there's a surprising amount of water underneath Antarctic ice and that moving water underneath any kind of continental glacier is maybe a much bigger deal than we thought of earlier. And that gets us into the flood stuff. But I, I'm sorry, I, I have limited. Our drumlins moraines? Technically, no, but there's some similarities. Um, again, we're back to what I was taught. Here's a map of the area where I grew up in southern Wisconsin. I mean, if you want, you can go to Google Maps right now and, and look in terrain view at uh, Jefferson County, Wisconsin, or Walworth County. Um, and these are all the hills. And all the hills are parallel to each other, and all the hills have this teardrop shape. North is this way. And they're all drumlins. And what I was taught is that drumlins are made out of glacial till, so that's why they're similar to moraines, and that they are deposits and that you drop glacial till at the bottom of a glacier, and then you have the glacier flow over that pile of glacial till, and you kind of sculpt it with this tail going downstream. Well, if you haven't, you might look on my YouTube channel this past summer. I did a, a field video when I was visiting my mom back in Wisconsin, and I think I called it Drumlins, or I guess I just called it Drumlins. Nick on the fly drumlins. And I shared as I was walking around on our main hill, which is a drumlin, that a newer idea is that this is not really a bunch of stuff dropped by the glacier. In other words, each drumlin, so this is the newer, I guess more controversial explanation, even though it's been whatever. Instead of these are just selected places where you drop these uh, scoops of cookie dough. Instead, the thought is that everything was deposited as glacial till and that most of the stuff between the drumlins has been washed away. So these are like remnants of a thick, continuous deposit of glacial till as opposed to simple places where the ice dropped a bunch of stuff. Again, long-winded answers here for you today. But I have learned that this Ice Age stuff really, maybe it's not an accident that we had more than a thousand. This ice stuff um, speaks to many more people than the norm in geology. It's, and I think it's simply because it's young, geologically. It, the landforms are still there. So you can literally go out and drive to that place and kind of see the water that used to be there, or the ice that used to be there. And then we intersect with global climate discussions, and that's a whole nother angle that that'll be interesting on Tuesday. I'm sorry, I've only answered two questions. Let me try a couple more before we quit. 
Uh, Joseph, I did, uh, I did a full live stream on the Milankovitch cycles and Milankovitch himself. And so I'll touch on it on here on Tuesday, but I think I'll have them watch that. I was happy with that one. I think that's the one where I pretended to drink a bunch of gin out of a bottle and everybody was outraged because they thought I had a drinking problem. Um, and I've, I've forgotten most of what I learned about Milankovic already, but that's probably how I will uh, incorporate some, some stuff online. Two more, why not? Kim, why do we study Ice Age? Well, I'm not sure where you're coming from with that, Kim. Uh, I can guess. You know, I deal with the public. Well, I used to deal with the public a lot <laughs> in, the, in the flesh. And I talked to, you know, agricultural groups and irrigator conferences and, you know, not, not just academic groups is my point. And I feel more comfortable outside of academia than I do here, by the way. But there's quite a few questions or comments, some kind of more uh, camouflage than others, that are basically saying, why are you even studying this stuff? Like, or, you know, a more hardcore thing, why are my tax dollars supporting this kind of research? How is it really helping anybody? And obviously, it's difficult to respond to that in a couple of minutes. And I have, I'm sure, Kim, you're not asking it that way. But I guess I'm taking your question and, and broadening it out. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I ticked a bunch of people off last time I tried to answer it honestly. Here. Um, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's interesting to figure out how systems work. And um, that's my answer, but you can go into all sorts of resources angles or um, health angles. It's interesting, that's my whole take on it. Mike, I tried to answer what a drumlin was just a second ago. Why study any, oh, okay. During glacial maximums, how much variability is there in the southern reach of the ice? How much variability is there? Um, well, I, this will be our last question. I'm still thinking and I'm not sure how, how to answer your question, but uh, we do have on this black line a very clear marking where the southern edge of the ice used to be. So there was a relatively stable ice front for at least a few centuries. I don't think that's a controversial statement. And while we had the ice margin at this black line, it was there long enough to bring a bunch of rocks from Canada and drop them and make a moraine. Uh, was there variability uh, with the amount of water coming off that as well to create the outwash? Sure. Uh, otherwise, I'm not sure what you mean by variability. Okay. Well, I guess that's enough for today. Um, you know how to get your yellow book if you want to order one. You already have the free PDF of the yellow book if you want to use that. Again, there are many meetings where we won't use the yellow book at all. So I, I don't know if you want to be that hung up on it. But, you know, once we get into plate tectonics, there will be quite a bit of use of it. But I will continue to be holding things up like this, you know. So uh, I don't want you to obsess over the yellow book necessarily. But if you want to order one for yourself, that would be a nice thing for the bookstore. Okay, everybody. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your Friday if you're in a certain time zone or uh, enjoy your sleep if you're in a different time zone. And um, I will not see you until Tuesday morning when we kind of have part two to this glacial discussion. 
And then later in the week, it will be Ice Age Floods, which I love talking about. And I'll have two full lectures on the Ice Age Floods. Again, if you go to, if you're kind of, if you're kind of new to us, and you're not sure what the rest of the class looks like, go here, click on this. There's more than the yellow book. There's a full calendar of the rest of our sessions and the day. You know, I'm 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 Swiss German, so I I, I don't I don't change the schedule at all. So. Uh, you'll be able to look ahead. This will go on until mid-March. So I, I think there's 34 lectures that I'll have for you. So we just finished number seven. Oh, we got a lot more to look forward to. Thank you for tuning in. I love you and goodbye. And goodbye. Just wonder how. On my tippy toes. I'll be curious if that stayed in focus. See you later. I got you here. You're still here, those that want to stick around. Can I switch the cameras? Before I quit this, I'm just going to play here for a second. It, have a good weekend. Bye. Uh, there's nothing here that I can switch the camera in case I screw this up again. can't click on that. I can't click on that. There's nothing I can, oh, edit. Hang on. I'm, I, I'm just, I'm just playing here. Am I still live stream? Yeah, I'm still live streaming. I just hit edit. If I click on live chat, that doesn't get me to a new camera. Details. I'm going to still have, still have 600 people here. I'm going to type something in while I'm live streaming. I'm just going to type in the description because that my, my title just still says new, new glacial till. Maybe it does for you too. What if I uh, does this work? I'm still live streaming and I went into the edit menu and I put in, does this work? Yep, it does. It now says, does this work in the show description? I'm seeing some yes, I see some no. Okay, I'm confused, so let me try this again. I just changed the description and I asked you a question. I'm waiting for somebody. Hey, Papa Soup, Oscar. So Papa Soup and Teresa and Lisa. See, many of you, have, did you have to refresh uh, your page? to see my math problem? Now you're all seeing it, seven, yes. But you needed to refresh?
Oscar, no change in this. Well, it doesn't even, okay, thanks. It still doesn't help me with my camera problem though. Okay, so that works without refreshing. So I can, I don't know why I would ever do that. Well, that's encouraging. And I'm gonna change the category. It's, uh, this is not people in blogs, this is education. I'm gonna save that. And now all I need is a camera menu because I could change those other two things in, in real time and it worked immediately for you. <clears throat> Language, tags, paid promotion, no thank you. Not made for kids, playlist. I'll add the playlist. This is a Geology 101 live stream. I'm gonna remove the other one that I, I quit on. Schedule. Nope, there's nothing for cameras. I, I guess it makes sense. That would be too much to do. I'm getting greedy, but I have to be extra cautious about selecting the right camera and the right mic or I'm going to have this same problem, right? If you didn't join us at the beginning, I, I had... I mistakenly selected the camera on the laptop, not this camera that I'm using now. And I, I had to make a new live stream because I, I was on the wrong input source. Yeah, there's, there's just not that option. While I'm live streaming, see, that's the issue, right? As soon as I'm not live streaming, I've got other selections. Okay, that's enough. Thank you. Have a good weekend. See you on uh, Tuesday. Goodbye.